right here at the beginning. So um, at this time, I want to convene a public hearing for the end of course accelerated instruction. Um, note the policy EHPC legal requires the district to separate budget funds for the purpose of accelerating instruction for students who have not performed satisfactorily on required end of course state assessments and are at risk of dropping out of school. The policy also requires a public hearing to share the evaluation of the effectiveness of the accelerated instruction. Um, and at this time, I'd like to go ahead and suspend the uh, public hearing and open the regular meeting where we'll go through um, the opening down through the spotlight, uh, which is why everybody is here for the most part uh, for the spotlight. So uh, at this time, I would like to call this meeting of the Bryan Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present. This meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. I wish to extend a warm welcome to everyone present. Citizens may make comments about topics relevant to district business. Topics should be limited to five minutes. Comments concerning specific students or personnel will be heard in closed session. As you please turn off the sound of any electronic devices that you may have. And at this time, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be by video from Crockett Elementary. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. By God! And by God! They were very energetic. However, Way to get us going. Okay, at this time we do not have any citizens' comments, um, so we will move down into the spotlight recognition. And it's where we normally recognize two of our uh, Teachers of the Month, but uh, just uh, one, the Elementary Teacher of the Month, is the only one that was able to be here today. So at this time I would like to um, invite up the Principal uh, Collins. All right, so fourth grade, here she is, bilingual English language arts teacher Mireya Antunes is committed to doing whatever it takes to ensure student success. With a no excuse attitude, she meets students where they are to bring them where they need to be, and she truly exemplifies the essential late and what it means to be regal. Her work ethic is evident to all. Regardless of when you enter her classroom, you will always find students engaged. Her workstations are rigorous and aligned and routines and procedures are in place. She should be a model and for real, she really should be a model for guided reading. Um, she's amazing. Ms. Santunas' commitment extends beyond the classroom. She serves on several committees. She writes social skills lessons for our, our school and she leads, she really facilitates in, in leads her partner and with um, our instructional co coach in her planning PLCs. But one thing that makes Ms. Antunes really special is that she has sat in her student seats because Ms. Antunes was a Regal Legal when she was in elementary Aww. school. Aww. So she really is a role model for her students, um, showing them that when you work hard, you can achieve anything and also modeling the importance of giving back to your community. So the students, families, and staff of Neal Elementary are truly blessed to have Ms. Santunas, and we are so proud that she is a Brian ISD October Teacher of the Month. Uh, as Mr. Stasny brings um, a certificate, I'd also like to thank BBT for their general do uh, generous donation. Yes. 
Thank you. And now at this time, we will suspend the regular meeting, and I will reopen the public hearing again on the end of course accelerated instruction. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kristen Besaw. I'm the RTI Dyslexia Coordinator, and I'm here to uh, present for this public hearing over accelerated instruction. Here we go. So this public hearing is required by the EHBC legal policy that says that we must provide accelerated instruction to students who do not pass the end of course exam and we have to budget for that appropriately and then hold a public hearing to discuss those results. So in Bryan ISD, we had many programs this summer. You see those listed here on the screen. One of those programs was new this past summer and that is the power camps. However, for this hearing, we're only here to talk about the end of course test acceleration. So we began planning um, about this time uh, and then on into the spring for, for summer school and our offering for the end of course accelerated uh, instruction. We began planning and uh, made some decisions based on the calendar um, and the options that we had uh, in order to offer those days. So we um, held the accelerated instruction from June 3rd through June 24th. Students had the ability to attend two sessions per day. So a student who needed uh, end of course test acceleration, they could, um, they could get that acceleration in up to two classes. We had campus advertisements, we had counselors, teachers, um, we had automated calls that went out to all of the students who were eligible for this end of course acceleration um, in order to encourage them to attend. We also offered transportation throughout the district to, um, to those students who needed it. We had seven sites at different campuses throughout the community for those students to catch the bus to come to Bryan High School where it was held. And then we had a, a middle of the day bus and then also an end of day bus. One of the incentives that we offered for students was the ability for them to earn back credit that they may also have not received during the school year. So this was all offered to students free of charge. So students could come to summer school, participate in the end of course test acceleration and also receive credit recovery should they need uh, to do that if they met the attendance and um, the grade requirements for that. We did have higher than um, what we've typically had in the past in terms of attendance. We had over 500 students take us up on this. So this means that over 500 students were there um, and only missed two or less days. So that we consider that, uh, we consider that a win. In terms of the budget, this is the budget and it's in line to what we've spent in years past. It's even a little bit less. We had more teachers this summer because we had more students to take us up on this offering, um, but we had a few less days um, because of the calendar. So um, you can see we had 24 teachers with two support staff and supplies and transportation. In terms of our performance and progress, you can see um, for each of the five uh, end of course tests that students took, you can see how many students attended the acceleration days and then also subsequently took the test as well as that passing percentage in the scale score. As you may remember from previous times that we've talked um, about this in the public hearing, that scale score is really what we look at because that is telling us that we are filling in those gaps for students and that they are increasing their ability to do well on these tests. And then finally, what do we do moving forward? We know that this is not all that our 
students need. This is not all that we provide for our students. Our students have the opportunity to enroll in intervention courses at the high school level should they need to for their end of course test and receive local credit for those. We have um, courses offered in each of those areas. Sometimes we have multiple courses offered, um, especially in the case of language arts because we do have um, two tests for students to take there. And then we're also offering grade repair um, throughout this uh, fall semester and spring because we know that the more successful we can have students be right now and help repair those things right now, the easier our job will be in the end. So, do we have any questions? I and mean, this is a public hearing, so I don't know anybody. Do you Looking guys? at the English one, the English two, so the English one, there wasn't a lot of, uh, I guess, 18% of the hundred and something were successful. So then I'm guessing that that then bleeds over into English too. I, I, how does that progression work for students? So usually for English one, um, we see a larger number of students um, who might need that extra remediation. And then by the time English two rolls around, they, they do much better. So they're, um, sometimes that difference has to do with the difference in the number of students who actually need to take it. The other thing with the end of course test that um, we work on through the curriculum is that this is the first time that students are taking that combined test for language arts. So it is, it is a lot different for them and sometimes they need more exposure. Sure. So th knowing that this is really going to be something we continue, of course. Yes, ma'am. Which in a lot of ways, I mean, I'd see all these successes um, and especially numbers, especially with everything that was going on this summer still. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but just assure me, which I'm sure we are, that we're looking at what was the main reasons or, or causes or we're studying why it was only 18% and then 33 is not bad but that we're looking into that specifically. And it could be personnel. I mean, it could be a lot of things. And so I know we'll continue, but um, I know we're doing that. We are. Yeah. You, you, we are in, um, you know, the, the English one and two curriculum and on up uh, into the other Englishes that continues to spiral in. Um, with those uh, standards and, of course, writing skills that they need. So, um, but again, I feel like the percentages don't always tell the whole story. The largest part of the story is those scale scores. But yes, ma'am. What was, what was the length of the, the services provided during the summer? How, how many days was this? So this summer, it was 11 days. Right. So. Is that typical of what other districts do, or do we, or do we know? Um, I, I think other districts do it different ways. A lot of it depends on, um, because the tests are offered that June 22nd, 3rd, 4th, it's the same time. A lot of it has to do with when schools get out. So obviously schools who don't get out till later in June, they're going to have less days. But you know, this isn't the only thing that we do for students. We're also offering those intervention courses during the school year and catching them, hoping to catch them early in order to help them be successful. Yeah. So Ms. Beesaw does a tremendous job as Dr. Holt Camp does as well. Uh, a couple of things. So you all are aware of the new statutes regarding House Bill 4545 and the additional required minutes of supports and um, tutoring that has transpired during the school year in addition to 
the accelerated instruction. And a lot of that transpires through the courses that Mrs. Besaw was discussing a few moments ago. But she mentioned something else I think I wanted to bring your attention to that I think is very important. English 1 and 2 is one of the biggest hurdles for a high school student to overcome. And it is because they combine the reading and the writing into a singular test. It's somewhat longer than the others, although there has been work in the prior years from the state level to walk that back a little bit and make it more reasonable in terms of its time frame. But there's a big shift coming in this year and in next year to star assessments for reading for grades three through eight. They will all be combined into reading and writing together. That big shift in that assessment will be helpful for when the students get to the high school level. They've already had exposure. They've already practiced in those areas to be prepared for that type of a test, that modality and that kind of content being blended together. Um, but it does mean a big shift for our three through eight students. And that right now, this year, there'll be field test items that'll be on the exams. We will only test reading this year, but you will have the writing questions built in as field test items. And then next year, the plan is for the state to make those combined assessments across all grade levels. So some big shifts coming for that. Um, and of course, a, a re-understanding of what the baseline will be when they change that test um, in the coming year. So something else for us to be aware of. I know we're talking about ninth grade, but it all builds to this moment, ninth through 12th grade. I was, I was wondering how much of that was reading. So with the change coming, is the length, is, is the, the kids gonna have, long, are the kids gonna have longer time to take it or the test gonna shrink on both in both categories. So the state put in um, some, or the statute put in limitations on how long those tests can be now, so they all must comply with those provisions. So they will be similarly um, in length to what a current assessment would be for that grade level and age. That's it's age appropriate for that grade. With more reading embedded in there? In Writing. The They'll bring writing in. Writing has only been assessed um, most recently, because <laughs> it's changed over the years, in grades four and seven, and then of course blended into nine and ten, English one and two. Now it'll be grade three will have a writing component, grade four will, five, six, seven, eight, but it'll be on a singular test um, with some different types of questions. They're also changing up the types of questions that you're gonna start seeing on EOCs and on STAR, um, different style of questioning, not just multiple choice interactions or even grid answers, um, but very different structure than we've done historically. And how as a long state. will our teachers have to change their ability to ask questions like <laughs> it's gonna be asked on? So we're, we're actually practicing with some of those questions right now to get our teachers comfortable with it and our students comfortable with it. Um, but it, it will take some time. You're absolutely right, Mrs. Waller. And then one final point, uh, back to Kristen's notation. The number of students that, that come for the third administration changes from year to year. We're pleased to see more this year than, um, than in years past. But um, that scale score is so important to know that the child's making progress towards that next iteration. If they did not meet at this time, how many questions away are they? How far are they from meeting those markers? Because that informs the students who are sitting in those courses right now to be ready for the upcoming December readministration of those assessments. So while the state has us hold a public hearing on this moment, it's not just this moment. They test two other times during the school year to be prepared for this one moment if this is the test they take. If that makes any sense. Well, I'm glad to see the numbers. I know transportation played a big part in that, so I'm glad that we were able to provide transportation because I wonder what the numbers would be like if there was no transportation. They were quite a, a bit less prior to Kristen putting that in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is why we've seen an annual increase. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Kristen, how long did you have to pull all this together? <laughs> well, um, which time? <laughs> well, I know, <clears throat> I'm sure it was a short time you've done a remarkable job. Oh, thank you. I, I know on the first slide you refer to grades one through eight having power camps, but we also know that a lot of eighth graders take algebra one. Yes. Is there room for them to go into the credit recovery if they need to? So this past the, summer, 
power camps were offered in July. So that way they did not conflict at all with those students who needed EOC. And I guess facility. more of my question is the eighth graders that completed eighth grade but did not pass algebra one, are they still able to recover yes. that? Yes, they, they the were program? able to come to Bryan High School and be in okay. those EOC recovery courses in June. Okay. That's a good Thank question. You. Thank y'all very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and at this time, we will conclude the uh, public hearing. And we will resume the uh, regular meeting with the standing committee updates. Uh, city school is. Um, engineer, uh, Dr. Hirvon, sorry. Um, at the end, I chime in and add anything this week or this month our city school meeting was a little different because <clears throat> most of the city uh, representatives were at a conference and so their end of it was very very small so we were at the blue bistro which is the gourmet foods lab uh, on Bryan high school for those of you who know much about it it's the old blue cafeteria and it was like, it was amazing. The service, the food that the students prepared, the way they prepared it, the place settings. So we, because we didn't really have uh, the typical meeting that we have, we really got to enjoy the students. We got to ask questions. Um, the food was amazing. And uh, there's so many of them back there. That program has really, really grown. And those students looked so happy and busy, and and they were, oh, they were friendly. It was great. It was a wonderful opportunity for us to see that program, um, the growth it's made in the last several years. I agree. It was a wonderful day since the audience was small to get to interact and connect with the teachers and the students and brag on their program. We actually invited Laura King, the assistant director of CTE, to join us that day, which was perfect for that moment because she was able to highlight and showcase a few of our other CTE programs as well. So it was a very good meeting. Great. If there's no other comments or questions, and we'll move down to the uh, Vienna Superintendent Report. All right. Matthew LeBlanc's going to pull that up. It's my pleasure to share some updates. There's so many wonderful things happening. It was hard to narrow the focus tonight, but I'll move right into the current COVID-19 numbers in Bryan ISD, and much like what you're seeing in the community, thankfully the numbers are trending downward. Today's report, you'll notice that there's only one staff member with a positive uh, case at this time, and only eight students. So we're super pleased with that, but we're not gonna let our guard down. We're gonna maintain the, uh, the COVID protocols that we have in place. And uh, we're pleased with these numbers trending downward because this means that our teacher absences are also declining. But should we need a substitute, we are having a better trend rate with that as well. As we know, all across the state and nation, we have a shortage of substitutes. So we're very pleased with these numbers, and we hope this continues. That's great. Moving on, we're uh, very excited also because this past weekend was a uh, special occasion for our fine arts department, our bands in particular. Rudder and Brian bands both earned first division rating at our UIL regional and they are both advancing to area. But with this news, I'm pleased to report this is the first time in the history of Rudder High School for them to receive all Division I ratings and to advance. So we're very pleased for uh, the kids at Rudder High School. They've been working so hard and it really came together for them. And if you were at any of the recent football games, you were able to see a little sneak uh, peek of what they did in that contest. And uh, they, again, they were both advancing. Rudder actually competes at the next level this weekend on October 23rd at uh, Channel View ISD. And then Brian A is in the 6A division and they will compete on October 30th in Round Rock ISD. Also, speaking of Friday Night Lights, uh, we have had some real excitement. Brian High School uh, actually played first and I, uh, their game was on October 8th. They played Colleen Shoemaker and won uh, that night. So that was fun for everyone in attendance. Rudder High School recently played Lamar Consolidated Fulcher on October 15th. They also won that night, but this was more than just football, although that was 
quite the victory for both programs. You can notice in the pictures the number of students in the stands at Rudder and Bryan High School. The, uh, the stadium was full of great energy, lots of school spirit and pride, and not just uh, the, the football team winning that night because it takes the village. We had cheerleaders and band and drill team and color guard and the choir performing. So, so many organizations were there that night celebrating and, and showcasing their talents. And we're just so pleased that Brian SD made some bold decisions with the support of our board, of course, to open our doors this year and to provide as much normalcy as we possibly could. I know in some school districts, they, they're not taking advantage of, of that in the way that we did. Uh, so again, this is just a real honor to be able to serve our kids in this way and to give them these memories. Moving on, um, we are super excited that we've had two rounds of the show up and win for the teacher, well, staff incentives. And um, we just most recently drew the winners for $1,000 checks where uh, we awarded at Rudder High School, Grace Pierce won a $1,000 check. Molly Wilder at Bowen Elementary also received a $1,000 check. And Caitlin Stevens from the CNI department received a $1,000 check. In the $500 HEB gift card uh, category, Demita Smith from our transportation department was a winner. Fidel Fernandez also from our transportation department. And then Shanna Filburn from Johnson Elementary, all winning $500 gift cards from HEB. And then our $100 gift cards for local restaurants include Leonard Cohn from Bryan High School, Kennedy Rogers at Houston Elementary School, and Karen McMillan representing SFA Middle School. This has just been a really exciting uh, opportunity for our staff. We've had two rounds of winners and it's truly the highlight. Lots of teachers and staff members actually log on and watch us uh, select the winners live. So that's been a lot of fun and a great incentive to encourage our staff to be in attendance. And in these pictures, you see our prize patrol from HR going out and delivering. And then tonight we have uh, obviously conflicts. So we're here, but some of our staff is actually at the Brazos Valley College and Career Night. Uh, this is open to all Brazos Valley High School students, and it's held at the Rellis campus, which is wonderful in itself. And this wonderful event is sponsored by Bryan ISD, College Station ISD, the uh, Rellis campus, and Blinn College. And it's just an opportunity to go and explore life after high school. Uh, the Greater Texas Foundation is also involved. And they provide different breakout sessions for parents and students to learn about the uh, college application process, life, should you choose going, going into college, what to expect, et cetera. And they have all the experts on hand to uh, provide FAQs and uh, more opportunities to learn about the process. And then finally, uh, just some additional updates. We're pleased that our eighth grade students will be at the Brazos County Expo for the Youth Career Fair coming up this Wednesday. Our ninth and 10th and 11th graders have been really busy in high school as they took the PSAT. Our seniors used that day to take either the TSIA or the SAT. So lots of testing uh, in their high schools. And all of our students have completed the beginning of the year measures of academic progress. We refer to that as MAP testing. So some of our parents have already received the first round of scores uh, and the others are forthcoming. So lots of good work went into that. And of course, we're going to use those scores to inform important decisions for instruction and enrichment as well as intervention. So good work in our schools by all of our teachers. Any questions? Busy. Been busy, busy month so far, but a great, uh, great month. Excellent. Thank you. And if there's no further questions, then we will move on with the agenda. And um, it brings us up to item six: items for discussion and or action, starting with the consent agenda. I move um, approval of all the items listed on the consent agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Harland, a second by Mrs. Benford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Consent agenda is approved, and we will move down to regular items, starting with business services. Uh, first up is consider approval of a re resolution approving the 21 um, assessed property value and property tax levy. <clears throat> yes, good evening. Thank you. Um, this uh, is always <clears throat> at this time of the year we uh, bring forward this uh, resolution. It's a culmination of uh, the, the entire process that we go through. Remember back in August, uh, we uh, adopted our budget, 
uh, set our, our tax rate. And tonight uh, we bring forward a uh, resolution uh, to uh, levy those taxes uh, to support the budget. Um, the uh, property tax code requires that all governing uh, bodies of a taxing jurisdiction uh, approve the tax levy for the year. Uh, that basically uh, verifies the uh, Brazos Central Appraisal District's uh, values and uh, authorizes the tax office uh, to go ahead and levy and collect those taxes on our behalf. I move of approval of the attached resolution approving the 2021 property tax levy for the Bryan Independent School District as $116,757,422.06 as presented. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Harland, a second by Mrs. Duane. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> and that will move us down to consideration and possible action on two non-exclusive easements to the city of Bryan, doing business as Bryan, Texas Utilities for electrical utilities on the new, um, <clears throat> new third intermediate school. It is recommended to grant the attached easements to the property. Yes, yeah, so BTU needs two non-exclusive easements in order to provide power to intermediate three to the, uh, to the transformer there. This easement will give access to the property for the purpose of installing and maintaining electrical utility services to the Intermediate 3 campus. We sort of need the utilities, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> There's not a motion on this one. We, we could add live a motion. Do you want me to yeah, I, I think we can probably just read the annotation as a motion. To allow Brian BTU access to property for the purpose of installing and maintaining electrical utility services to the new third intermediate school, I move that we grant the attached easements to the property. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Harlan, a second by Ms. Duane. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We now have power. Yay. Soon to have power. Yay for power. I have access to power. Yay. Um, okay, next up is discuss and consider approval of a purchase request over $50,000 for data analytics software. This is a forecast five that we've talked about mm -hmm. in prior workshops. Yes, sir. We, we talked about this at the last meeting. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring this back tonight and, and uh, just cover it a little bit more. Um, as we talked about, it's a data analytics uh, software uh, used to make, uh, uh, you know, decisions, a uh, tool that we can use our, and leverage our current uh, data, both our demographic and peer data, uh, to see, you know, how our, how our students are doing and, and <coughs> compare many of the, uh, many of the areas that we, we need to look at. And it, it, what this tool does is it, it combines all of our data uh, into one place and allows us to produce reports. Uh, and different things that can come down to our stakeholders and, and really pinpoint the areas that they need to uh, focus on and uh, give us the, the, the best uh, ability to uh, further our, our uh, education for our students and things. Also, we want to mention this, this will be helpful in, in tying those uh, outcomes and things back to board goals um, as we uh, work through that process as well. And I know we're going to discuss that a little bit later tonight. but. Uh, that will be coming forward. Uh, we talked about in the last uh, meeting that there would be some items uh, that we feel we can probably uh, replace with this uh, particular software. As we worked through that process and looked at those things, um, at this time we feel that there's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a better option to probably go ahead and implement this and then work through that process to uh, see what we can eliminate. And so probably for this year, we would run both of those programs and, and bring back it at a later date the things that we're going to transition into. Some of these would be uh, eliminating programs that the campuses are currently using, and that would be uh, could be disruptive to their their ongoing process uh, as we go through the year, and we we don't want to do that. Um, the uh, the cost for these uh, there's there are th three different uh, modules that we're looking at. Um, the one that's called Five Lab, which is uh, very, very tied into the uh, 
into the student data and, and uh, the demographics and those kind of things. That one is uh, 60000 for the first year with implementation costs. Uh, and that we can fund through ESSER uh, with some of the federal relief, relief grants that we've received. Uh, the other two, the uh, five site and five cast. The five cast is more based on the for the financial uh, side of the house. So that's um, that's one that that uh, will help us out in preparing reports and that. And five site crosses over both, so that could be partly uh, funded with ESSER as well. But five cast would have to be funded with um, with local funds on that. And I would just caution, as we've talked about previously, and I'll try to keep my comments fairly short on this, but a lot of that will probably offset man hours uh, that it takes currently to produce um, produce some of these reports <coughs> and, and just drive the consistency within the reporting <coughs> within the accounting area. Um, and then what I'm what in, in addition to everybody from the leadership team, I think this is a specific piece of software that really empowers the principals mm -hmm. and those building um, <coughs> building level admin, admin teams that they can get access to the same data in real time, mm -hmm. you know, as close to real time as, as possible. And so it empowers them to, um, to, to follow through and provide that campus level leadership that's, that's there. And I agree with not taking away anything that they currently have, but my hope would be that they would not want to use what they currently have six months from now. Yes, that's yeah. hopefully that. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, and I and I, I agree, and you don't know yet, and that's fine. And we, if it's feasible, I, please let us know one way or the other what what happens there, because we'd want to be able to. <coughs> explain to people that we're doing everything we can not to just add on, add on, and but, but that we're replacing with something better to a large extent because uh, I think a lot of the public has fear and sometimes <coughs> maybe even I have fear that whenever you're a public entity that there's not, there's not as much incentive to, to be, you know, I guess to economize or whatever you want to call it, uh, be, be uh, efficient with with funds because well it's you know it's not not coming out of the bottom line so to speak I mean it is but you know what I mean it's, it's public dollars it's tax dollars so uh, that's just a long way of saying I appreciate y'all's effort in that regard and and I, I hope y'all will let us know how that goes yes sir we we will double back and and uh, as we evaluate all of our software programs we'll we'll incorporate this in and, and bring a report back to y'all. I move approval of the contracts to forecast five analytics in the total amount of $93,712.87 as presented. Check. I have a motion by Ms. Waller, a second by Mr. Stasny. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Motion carries. And we will. Yay. Yes. <laughs> um, Up with my, uh, next item on the agenda is 7A4, consideration and possible action on the services agreement between Bryan Independent School District and Clark Eisenhower Real Estate Services, LLC. Yes, thank you. This, this is a, uh, an option we're, we're looking at um, as, as we've gone through this entire process of uh, starting with the bond projects and looking at the uh, uh, the intermediate three uh, being built on the current uh, transportation and maintenance site. Uh, we have a group uh, committee that started uh, about 18 months ago, I think, looking at all of the processes that we were going to have to go through and things that were going to have to be moved and, and uh, you know what what uh, timeline that would take and all of those kind of things. As we've gone through that process and, and uh, finding a, uh, another location for uh, our, you know, buying land to uh, to move the transportation maintenance building. As that's been delayed, as, as y'all have been aware, uh, as we've gone through this process, that's that's caused some some uh, timeline issues. We're going to have to to look at, at uh, every available option to try to try to resolve. Um, we will have to move uh, transportation and maintenance. It looks like to a temporary facility uh, as we go through. Now there's. Uh, a lot of different options that we could look at existing facilities, uh, you know, uh, redoing a, a current property that we own, 
Uh, another option that, that this will help us look at just to cover all our bases would be uh, looking at a rental uh, facility if, if something is available. And we felt like we needed someone that had the uh, resources and, and uh, could look at that and, and do a fairly quick job of finding uh, possible locations and things that were available for us. Um, at this point, uh, anything that, that we went through and, and we are preparing, I, I believe at the next meeting, we'll have a, a, a full-blown presentation on uh, what we're looking at and the potential uh, possibilities for that. So uh, we'll come back in the boardroom again and, and discuss this further. Uh, there's no, at this point, no uh, financial ramifications uh, for this uh, particular agreement just basically allowing us to work with them. And if there came a point where there was any kind of a lease or, or any agreement on that, of course, that would come back to the board uh, to discuss at that point. Uh, this is just allowing us to, to work with this company uh, to try to look at all of our options and, and bring the best uh, available option back to the board. Are you, are you the goal to find something that's already close to being ready to use, or, or what's, what's the well, plan? Yeah, and so we, we've we've uh, discussed this uh, at length, uh, different options and, and all of the possibilities um, from uh, you know even even putting them you know on campuses things like that. And so we're, we'll bring the presentation back next meeting. But yes, this this would be an option of looking at uh, you know what would it cost to to look at a facility that would house uh, perhaps the entire group. Uh, or, or somewhere in between two different options, but to try to find all those options, we really have we don't we really don't have the resources or the manpower to try to pin down if there's uh, something that's uh, available like that out there. So this would allow us to work with this group, and they can uh, run through their their databases and things and come up with possible options pretty quickly, uh, so that we can bring uh, you know if there's an option for us out there, we can bring that back to the board. But, but yes, to answer your question, that, that would be the option that we'd be looking at in this scenario. Um, but it's not the only option we're looking right. at. Well, you know, we obviously have that big, big piece of land, but you'd have to do an awful lot to it to turn it into something usable and, uh, on a temporary basis. That doesn't right. seem practical. Uh, one of, the only other thing that comes to mind is not exactly, I guess, an ideal location, but it would be temporary, of course, would be out at Rellis. I, I don't know if they really have that much unused area. Maybe it's all being used. I don't know, but uh, as you know, there's a ton of space up there. It was a um, an air, airport one time, so um, I, I just kind of wonder if, if that's even a, a remote possibility that they could accommodate us for a while. Did, did anybody check with them? Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the the angle that we're looking at to explore with this is is all the possible options that may be out there that would that would uh, you know from from you know a vacant land that we could move a. a um, portable too, and use as a as a temporary facility to, you know, spreading them across the district in different office spaces and those kind of things. So we're we're trying to explore every possible option and, and uh, you know bring that back for the board for discussion. Well, I did read the agreement and, and I was glad to see that it was easy to terminate if you decided it wasn't being helpful, and uh, also that uh, the fee ultimately would be paid by the the landlord rather than than the district. So, of course, that can always affect the rental, uh, naturally, Correct. when yes. the landlord's not getting the full amount. But still, uh, that at least uh, sounds a lot more favorable than it, than it could be. So, so I'll, I'll move that the board approve the services agreement between Brian and Penn School District and Clark Eisenhower Real Estate Services, LLC. Second. A motion by Mr. Stasny, a second by Mrs. Waller. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, and thank you. Thank you. That was quick for your parts tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us into teaching and learning. Consider approval of bilingual and ESL exceptions and waivers to 2021-2022. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jordana Adams Molina. I'm the director of bilingual education. I think we met last time. So nice to see you guys again. Today we're going to look at bilingual exceptions and ESL waivers. The purpose of an exception and a waiver is to inform TEA of the need for appropriately certified teachers in bilingual education 
and ESL programs across the state. When we look at our current programs that we have here in Bryan, we use the transitional bilingual program, which we need a bilingual certified teacher uh, in grade level content area and that holds the actual bilingual certification. Under the dual language program in self-contained and departmentalized, the teacher must be certified in bilingual education and also the content and grade level. There's a little twist here with a paired uh, teaching partner in dual language, both teachers and content grade level uh, must be certified. Teacher in, the teacher instructing in English can be ESL certified, but the teacher instructing in the second language must be certified in bilingual education. So that's, that's very noteworthy. As far as ESL, we have ESL certified teachers for students identified as emergent bilinguals or our ELL students, our English language learners uh, in English language arts and reading. We do not have to file a waiver if students receive instruction in ELAR through co-teaching, push-in models, or through any uh, additional ESL or ELAR classes. This is what TA provides us, uh, their scenario chains that we go through. It's very, you gotta love it. It's very, very simple to, to follow. But these are what we use with each and every teacher to decide if they're appropriately certified for the programs. So on the left is our transitional bilingual program, and then on the right is our dual language, and then we have one more, which is for our ESL program. Thank you, T. Ms. Waller, you thought our uh, board training requirements were hard to follow. <laughs> 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 yes. We need little That's board magnifying. <laughs> So when we're looking at district staffing, uh, we currently have 191 certified bilingual teachers in the district, which is awesome. I'm super happy with that number. We have 521 ESL certified as well in the district, and you can see that trend towards more certification uh, for our teachers. And we also have four exceptional bilingual certified instructional coaches that help us in our with our programs. For this current year, uh, the proposal is to file six, only six exceptions and uh, 67 ESL waivers for, again, for this current school year. Uh, we have teachers in uh, our bilingual classes, only six that do not hold that certification uh, for, for bilingual or content area or grade level. Uh, we're working with them closely and I'll show you on the next couple of slides exactly what we're doing, the plan we have in place to address the six bilingual exceptions and then the 67 ESL waivers. This is super exciting. We offer uh, in the department some phenomenal professional development. And this year we're trying to be very creative and think outside the box. Uh, we collaborate with the Service Center and Texas A&M for training and preparation courses for the actual certification for a bilingual uh, teacher or ESL in our ESL program. We're uh, developing and ensuring systems of support to increase teacher retention by using, uh, we have bilingual monthly support meetings. We have some Saturday professional development that's coming up. We have lunch and learn opportunities. We have a, a collaboration with the service center and the opportunities are there for teachers to actually attend a PD session from 12 to 1245. So I'm working with the campus principals to see if we can get a teacher covered for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Again, thinking outside the box in order to provide teachers with those opportunities for professional development. Again, we have our exceptional instructional coaches that plan targeted uh, PD for the campuses and provide exceptional coaching for our teachers. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the uh, competitive stipends that we offer for the teachers. And then also we have a reimbursement that we provide uh, to the teachers once they pass their exam. And then also we reimburse to get that put on their SBEC certificate. Can I And not a lot of oh, school districts Sorry. do that. Sorry, while we're on this slide. Yes. What do we do for them on their Saturday professional development days? Is that an expectation? Or do we feed them well or do we pay We them? actually, in, we looked at, uh, again, finding ways to get teachers out to, to PD. So in our budget, uh, I was able to find it where we offer a supplemental pay to teachers. So we're actually paying them to come out. And we have 65 teachers that are scheduled for November the 13th coming out and getting trained on uh, sheltered instruction for ELL right. learners. It, it's, I'm super proud, I'm super excited. 
and it's worth the investment. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it, it might be a lot, but when you're looking at <laughs> sidelets, all these big corporations, it costs about $175 to train each teacher. Uh, but when we bring them here, we can offset that, especially when we have great numbers for attendance. We provide the book, lunch is on their own, so they get a big people lunch, it's an hour, but it's on their own. Uh, but it's, it's uh, I'm extremely pleased, as soon as we put it out, the feedback and teacher signing up was almost immediate. Within 48 hours, we had 30, 40 people, and then within a week, we had we were up to uh, 65, and we actually have a waiting list. That's so wild. And so we're spending our money on uh, wisely and getting those teachers out to, to that professional development. I love what you said about a big people lunch. Yes, <laughs> yes. Really it's cute. a big people lunch yes. for not, yeah. not um, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And obviously, we, we don't have an issue, but I was, was going to ask about that. Um, you know, does a, does a price go, I mean, basically, if we ever had an attendance issue, right, with that Saturday PD, I mean, could we open that up to other, my, my first thought was opening it up to like A&M term type students mm -hmm. and whatnot that, if it doesn't cost us any more, but we get more of a bang when we have a bigger group there, mm -hmm. you know, but right now it doesn't sound like we have that problem <laughs> at all. I mean, we have a waiting list, so. Yeah, we, we have the teacher turnout, so uh, <clears throat> it's definitely cost effective. We're, we're looking at our budget in the bilingual department and thinking about how can we reach the teacher and then how can that carry over to classroom instruction? So it's, uh, it's an investment for that Saturday, but um, uh, again, feel very strongly about that it's a fiscal and um, an ethical in investment for, for that PD. Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you, before you move forward, you, you mentioned the stipend. I, that was one of those things that I was kind of scratching my head about at first. That was actually several years ago, and, and unless things have changed, I think we were way outside the box on that, which was one of the reasons I had concerns about it. But but we've stayed with it as far as I know, and uh, you probably know a lot better than I do whether we are still kind of unique in that regard because our stipend was pretty pretty significant, as I recall. Stipend is $6,000 a year, and to my knowledge, we are very unique when it comes to offering the bilingual teacher that um, I, I don't have the numbers exactly for College Station or our, our surrounding districts, but I know that we're very competitive with that uh, bilingual certified stipend. Mm. Well, and, and again, it's it certainly has paid off. So, mm -hmm. I, I I wasn't opposed to the stipend. I was just thinking, does it, gee, does it have to be that much? But uh, it was uh, it certainly has made a big difference. I'm sure on recruiting. Mm -hmm. I, at least I would assume it does. In recruiting, retention, and what we're trying to do is come at both of them. So we're recruiting bilingual teachers through the competitive stipend, but also retaining them with the support that we're offering through valuable PD and coaching. So we not, what happens is, and that's kind of one of the causal factors for uh, the 67 ESL waivers, I, I believe, is a teacher turnover. So we want to get them here, we want to get them certified, and we want to keep them. Uh, we don't want to lose them after we go ahead and get them certified and so forth. So that's, uh, that's one thing to take into consideration when we're filing exceptions and waivers. What was their turnover rate? from the previous school year and how many, uh, we've been doing some data analysis. Uh, five site might be a good one for the, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, well played. <laughs> yes, um, but looking at the, the ESL waivers and basically the majority of the waivers are from new teachers. So new to the district uh, because what's happening is the expectation may not have been there at the previous district or they're actually a first year teacher or a second year teacher but the expectation at the campus level, the leadership, is for them to get ESL certified. So I'm, I'm looking forward to working with the teachers and providing those opportunities. And since you brought it up, I, I think one thing that would be interesting to look at uh, within this particular group is the impact of <coughs> having, having non-wavered teachers versus wavered teachers and where that ends up in um, <clears throat> with those writing scores mm -hmm. that we heard about earlier that are coming in earlier and more frequently, but specifically around the seventh and eighth, because I would assume that the language arts writing is probably 
a fairly challenging course. So, Mark, are you excited about our new data program? I, I, I think it, I think it opens up those possibilities to right. look yeah, at yeah, that, yeah. right, yeah. and yeah. see the yeah. value of that mm -hmm. of that certification that we're paying that stipend for. I would r love to run the numbers on the kids who did not pass, for example, uh, English one or English two EOCs. Are they ELL students, and was their teacher certified? Mm -hmm. That would be a Absolutely. great project. Mm -hmm. We can do that. We can yes, do that. I'm super excited. <laughs> and we're all very uh, excited, they're too. They're probably yeah. closed today, but we expect the contract to be in <laughs> and the system up and running. Uh, Ms. Johnson, Dr. Yabarro. Yeah. Kevin already emailed. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's paying the bill right I, now. Kevin's paying the bill right I'm now. I'm signed right up here. So, um, but yeah. That's great. I mean, mm -hmm. and thank you for all your hard work. You have hit the ground running. Oh, I appreciate that very much. My I appreciate goodness. that. That means a lot. <coughs> the, uh, to continue on with the plan for 21-22, uh, we're working uh, closely with the HR department in recruiting efforts. So we're going to uh, be participating in statewide job fairs, Sam Houston, uh, SFA, Texas A&M, UT Tyler, University of Houston, Clear Lake, Lamar, Texas State, really trying to uh, capture those teachers and bring them here. And we were talking about this the other day. Um, what does it look like to work in Bryant? How do we get teachers from the bigger cities that do have a five in front of their salary to come here? Uh, so I recruited Margaret uh, De Jesus. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's a local and she uh, really is, I'm bragging on her. Uh, she is able to uh, talk about the hometown feel. She's from here. Uh, so she's going with us on our recruiting efforts, but Letting people know that you're coming to a smaller community, there's um, different things that we can offer that you just can't find in, in Houston. So uh, we're, we're working together on coming up with presentations for the teachers and so forth at, at those uh, job fairs. Uh, we're partnering with universities and teacher uh, preparation programs uh, such as Aggie Term, and we're going to continue to sponsor uh, the H1B1 visas. Right now we have uh, a teacher from Venezuela and then a teacher on his way crossing the pond from London. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. So oh, very, wow. very exciting. Are there any questions? <laughs> I like that idea that you have. I think that um, is what we've probably been missing, the part we've been missing, that we go out and we do the recruiting and we tell them what they offer in the district. But to be able to hear what you're going to be getting when you come and actually live here, mm -hmm. what your family is going to be getting, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the important piece. Mm -hmm. Because you can come here and like your job, but if your family is not happy, then it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that. I really like that part. I think that's going to be, that's going to be a win. I move approval of the bilingual exceptions and ESL waiver reports as presented and authorize administration to make any necessary adjustments to the submission as new data becomes available. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Harland, a second by Mrs. Benford. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I've got board governance next for you, or the board goals is first up. So, so okay, I'm already jumping ahead to reading my long script here about training, but yes, um, we do have an item on uh, <coughs> discussing consider approval of the 21-22 board goals. Just to introduce, the board did meet last um, Monday. 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 <laughs> Um, so this is uh, on a, a team of eight and discuss the board goals and that's all I have to say because pretty much everybody was here is was in the room last Monday so absolutely and I'm just the facilitator for the conversation uh, for the board this evening but of course uh, as you mentioned Mr. McCall the board met last week uh, and keeping aligned to our vision and our mission uh, discussing what the goals would be for the district for the coming school year um, to keep us on track and to reinforce the efforts um, to move us forward through the pandemic. As we went through, um, the board reaffirmed the commitment to the five general categories of board goals that were previously in place with an academic goal, culture and climate, workforce, community engagement, and then safety and security. 
Um, most of what we talked about was kind of reestablishing re the key performance indicators that support each of these goals. And again, going back to, not to belabor the point, five lab, five site, and, and five cast, that software will be helpful in, in the monitoring of the progress towards each of these goals in a more granular level. But at the global level, the goals relatively remained unchanged save one. So as we kind of move forward again, the board goals serve as kind of that drive gear, knowing that all of the other goals need to work in tight alignment and be mutually supportive of those board goals. So whether it's district improvement plan, the campus improvement plan, or a particular department or division that's working on their plans, they should be in alignment with the larger goals of the district, which in fact are the board goals. So we all work to do that, and as these are set, we modify and adjust and kind of tweak ours to make sure they're in tight alignment. So the board goal for academic achievement, obviously support the academic and post-secondary success of every student. Um, that, um, from the conversation last week, was slated to stay on track. And the board goal two was the one that had a slight adjustment in wording. Um, it reads today, support a culture and climate that encourages a shared responsibility for a positive learning environment, which encourages, and this is the shift, engagement in both academic and extracurricular activities, really focusing on that involvement um, and that connectedness to the campus, the community, and, and the culture and climate of, of the school community in general, along with some volunteerism and service learning being a large portion of that. Uh, goal three also remained unchanged from last week, recruit and maintain a high quality workforce through competitive benefits and differentiated professional development like we just talked about. Uh, excited to see uh, Dr. Adams Molina move forward with that. It's been well received. And then community engagement, actively partner with students, families, staff, and the community to promote collaborative stakeholder engagement to achieve the district's vision. Uh, Mrs. Carabine has been continuing with all of the different uh, committees, groups, and teams that advise the superintendent and the board of trustees in the work of the school system and, and in fact just recently met with uh, student leadership from across the district and had um, the voice of the students, the, the absolute recipients of all of our work at the table to talk to us about what we can do to better support them. And then board goal five, obviously safety and security is paramount in, in all things that we do, but to ensure physically and emotionally a safe and secure learning environment while welcoming all students, staff, and visitors. So that, I again, I'm just the facilitator. That's where we left it last week, and I, I leave it to you for anything you'd like to see us adjust. So the kids will be happy, they'll succeed, and everybody behaves. Yes. Okay. World peace. I'm excited about it. We'll do our job <laughs> to the best of our abilities. Yeah. I, I think if you can go back to board goal two real quick, um, we had a lot of discussion, probably the most discussion around board two, board goal two um, last week, and, and I think one of the one of the takeaways is is just still ensuring that every student has a place to connect mm -hmm. within uh, mm -hmm. to, a place to plug in. <clears throat> and and that might start as a freshman year, but it continues to grow throughout their high school career. So that they're just that, that it may be a different event, or it may be a different club by the time they're a senior, or it may be a different focus. But they're still plugged in in an extracurricular activity somewhere. Um, and um, I, I and I. And challenge sometimes because I, you know, I'm just bringing up one of the examples that came up um, is um, um, and not current time, but speaking throughout the watching three of my other kids come through school. Um, I, I know there were times when it was very, I, I hate to say, adversarial between fine arts and coaches. But, you know, your my time is sacred, my time, it, you have to make a choice, one or the other. And, and I'm not sure that always came from coaches. So I see Janet looking at me going, okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure that's always from coaches. I actually think it's more the inverse now, to where if we're going to be a competitive first-class band, you have to commit to band period. You don't have time for athletics. 
you don't have time for all this other. And, and so somewhere, you know, I think it used to be the inverse of that. It was That's coaches. That's just an example. That right, that, that was just an example. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, but I think it was an inverse of that. But now I think it's swung the other direction. And somewhere there's a balance in there. And I, and I think right now, uh, as we're coming back from COVID and kids are reinventing themselves and reinventing high school, I think it's time to find that balance again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. As well as being, you know, high class students as well, sure. you know, but there, there's, but particularly, but I think that's a lot, was a lot of the discussion that we had. And, and yeah. I think one of the specific comments was, it used to not be uncommon to see somebody in a football athlete or a football uniform or a cheerleader uniform out there marching at halftime mm -hmm. or participating in halftime, and and it's it's um, seems like that's become less and less and less and less over the years. Yeah, um, I also like the conversation we had about um, flipping it to be this positive conversation mm -hmm. as opposed to reducing incidents of bad things happening, making sure that we're um, tracking the good things that are happening and trying to shift the language and shift the focus. To Just like that positive. little boy that was tying the little girl's shoe. <laughs> yeah. I perfect. thought that's a perfect example of yeah. so many of our eight essential eight. Yeah, I was going to tie it back. I think we did have a conversation about how we might think about tying to essential eight and more measurable. It may be more qualitatively measured, but it's still measurable um, gains in those areas. Just These are uh, all great comments. We actually began the discussion today at our cabinet meeting talking about this very notion of culture and climate. And uh, we were discussing the... Uh, the non-negotiables, removing barriers. We don't want any student to be eliminated from anything and uh, affording opportunities, engaging, connecting, feeling a sense of belonging. And it actually starts in elementary, you know, you know make that connection at that point and then see it through high school. Because uh, what we shared earlier with the good news, seeing those kids again at the Friday night football, it was more than football that night. Yes, the football team was winning and that felt great, but the band, the choir, the drill team, the student section, athletes from other programs in the stands supporting them. We had girls racing from volleyball that night to get over to the stadium. So that's, that's what it's all about. So we're excited about you wanting us to focus on this because this feels right and it's something we are committed to. Just if you bear with me for a little historical perspective. I, yes, I had kids in school. They're all grown and I've got lots of grandkids now. But, but uh, I would not have known at all about this except that that uh, my, my child was playing seventh grade basketball and it was girls, one, one of my girls, and a midweek game and the seventh grade and eighth grade took separate buses and the rules were that you couldn't take any you know, a backpack or anything to do any homework if you wanted to. So, you know, they played, uh, parents at the game, now you can't take your child home yet. They have to stay for the other game. Uh, the seventh graders, quite frankly, according to my daughter, didn't care a flip about watching the, the eighth graders play, but they had to stay. You couldn't, couldn't go home. The bus couldn't leave and take the kids home. This is on a week, you know, weeknight. Uh, they finally get everybody loaded up and take them home. And we're, you have to wait. Again, this is even if you went to the game, you had to ride the bus back. And, and you had to sit in the parking lot till the bus finally showed up, typically sometimes, I don't know, it's 11 o'clock. And yeah, at school the next day, and these were seventh graders. And, and the initial reaction I got from coaches was, well, they gotta be there to support the team, that's important, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, let's see, academics come first here, right? Uh, it was, to me, it was uh, what can happen if parents don't speak up and if we don't really do what we say we, we mean that, that, oh, you know, yeah, we're, we're great about athletics. But, but I mention that only because you can imagine what kind of influence that had on participation. I mean, a lot of parents like me, if it hadn't changed, would have said, you can't do that anymore. You know, you're, you can't be uh, out all night and when you've got a test the next day or whatever, just because the coach thinks it's a good idea. So, so I certainly hope we've never regressed to that point in any anywhere close to that. But that's just one of those things that uh, wouldn't have seen the light of day, I guess, if 
because none of the other parents were saying anything. They were not happy, but that was the only one that actually said, and it was, you know, I was on the school board, so that helped. So, uh, but, uh, but that was, that's how crazy things can get. I mean, I don't know if everybody agrees that's crazy, but I thought, man, this is crazy. And so, uh, I, I, again, that's a little history there about what can happen if you simply say the coaches get to decide what's best. Uh, that, that can happen. And, and, again, I know we have great coaches, and I know that I, I would certainly hope nobody feels that way, but it sort of is an example of what Mr. McCall was talking about is when they get so territorial about, about what they're doing that they just really lose sight of what, what's really best for that kid. I don't think that's happening right now. I hope not. <laughs> no, no. In fact, I was, uh, Mr. Stasny, I was thinking that my daughter plays um, eighth grade volleyball and they take their backpacks and she leaves after her game is over and is able to go on while the other kids are there. Sometimes we stay depending on what she has the next day and uh, what her grades currently are. <laughs> we, we make that choice as a family, and sometimes we stay and sometimes we don't. Uh, but they, they certainly are, are very flexible to work with. The ones that I've encountered, and I know under Ms. Ms. Williamson's uh, leadership, that's a very, very high focus of hers as well. Well, again, I want to mm -hmm. just say that was a long time But it goes ago. both ways. All, but, but, uh, all, uh, right. all directors, I, I they, all coaches, they, everybody. And, and, I, and I think mm -hmm. that... One of their, and again, I had more, well, I mean, I had both athletes and band and, and leadership in band um, <clears throat> under multiple directors, but um, I never would have known, short of Cooper and Christine's involvement in band, how competitive and really time demanding fine arts is um, versus, you know, and, and again, he didn't play football, he wrestled, but the time difference there was almost two, three to one, uh, the time that he had available in, in, in um, um, between Cooper, <coughs> for Cooper and Bant. And, um, and so um, I, I, I it's always easy to pick on the coaches, but I, I think we've given a free pass sometimes to fine arts too, um, um, as well, and they've become territorial as well. Uh, and, and I almost think that one of the um, one of the sub um, <clears throat> key performance indicators within this goal for the committee that really jumps down into those KPIs is is really, you know, as simple as how many did you have as a freshman? How many did you have as a senior? Mm -hmm. are, are there. And if you have, you know, 30 kids as a freshman and zero seniors, mm -hmm. there's probably a story there. Um, well, we could certainly um, do that in a longitudinal sense, too, so you can have a, a point to compare it to. I could right. work on that. Right. Yes. And so... Um, so, but I, but I think it's that because I, I love Mr. Uh, Stasny's, and I, and I believe it was essential goals, right? One and two, we could almost we we discussed whether they really need to be both be ones, and Mr. Stasny said they're both essential goals, uh, just because one and you know one, right now especially that culture and climate is critical. Um, coming back out of COVID, so. what and this stems off. We had a meeting the other day, a training, and we set and tweaked our goals. And this is our report <laughs> and our directives. And it was so positive. It was, it was such a, a good time for the, all of us that were there and including administration. It was very, and I want to stress how positive it was. So in essence, what everybody's saying tonight is, we want to, as a board and as a district, we want our kids to be involved in everything they possibly can be because we want them to enjoy learning. To enjoy learning means you're, you're wanting to do whatever is fun at school. It can be 
from whatever time you get to school till the last event that happens late on a Friday night. We want them to enjoy being the four high schools that, that we have. We want them to enjoy the middle schools, the elementaries, everything. And to do that, we want our teachers and sponsors and activity directors and coaches and everybody to encourage positivity. We want you here. If you're not happy, what can I do for you? And if you want to be in choir and be a linebacker, we can do this. And that's what we're asking. And we don't want anything negative out of this. We want everything positive out of this. Because if the kids are happy, the, the adults are going to be happy. And if the adults are happy, the kids are going to be happy. And if everybody's happy, lots and lots of grades are going to be good or better. And, and, and to the extent that if it's a kid's choice, they want to sign up for three or four fine arts, you know, they want to acquire a theater and two theaters and, mm -hmm. you know, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm all for it. I'm not saying they can't focus in one area. Uh, that's, that's not the goal here. But if, if the, if, if they're in multiple events and they're, they can't be, I, I, sometimes I get the feeling that they can't be defined a leader in multiple areas because the definition of a leader is you're focused on this area. If you're not in my area 100% of the time, then you can't be a leader and therefore you're not eligible for these other components. Um, <clears throat> so you're kind of punishing the kid for not making the choice. And, and that's what I think we have to be very careful of. And, and I'm not saying that it's, that it's, um, Ultimately, it, that it's a, um, it, that's how it's being perceived by the student perspective is, oh, well, I can't be there 100% of the time, so therefore I know I'm not going to be a part of. Right. It's that fallacy of specialization. That yeah, I, I'm, not be gonna be a, I, I'm not going to be chosen for yeah. a part because. I didn't yeah. fully commit right. in, in, in the eyes of what I think the adult wants me to do. Right. right. And I so. went to a really small school. I mean, there were 73 in my graduating class. And coaches and teachers didn't have choices. You know, everyone had to kind of do everything. But, you know, that small school kind of mentality. And I worried when my kid came to a school as large as Bryan High that, you know, he would be limited in his options because he'd have to make choices because others would force choices upon him. I'm happy to report, I don't think that's happened. He's done the things he wants to do, the way he wants to do it. He's been supported in that by his teachers and coaches. So I think it's possible. He, he also does the things he does, which isn't the things all kids do. So they may be having different experiences depending on what they're in. But um, it's certainly a good goal. I like what Rufy said about the positive focus. This isn't about trying to hurt anyone. It's about trying to make all the things we do even better. Well, and we want academic achievement. Yeah. And academic achievement comes from well-rounded individuals. And you don't get well-rounded individuals if you specialize. You and I think, too, Barbara, we need to listen to what the students want and not what we want as the adults. Because I can remember back before we had the mariachi band, mm -hmm. the students asking for it, asking for it. And um, it was always a pushback because of um, no one to teach it or no financial support. But I think if it's something that they want, it's no reason for them to not be able to get it, to at least try. Right. And, and that goes for everything. I think we talked about that financially. There's no reason why the child wants to participate in band. They can't afford a piece of equipment that we can't find a way to make that happen. Yes, ma'am. So I think if they decide they want to have a, a dancing group, then I think we should, if there's enough of them want to dance, then let them dance. So let's find a way to support it. To that point, Mrs. Benford, um, we have several principals who do exactly what you're suggesting. And they have a different group of kids who've had some different experiences. And so they've gone to the students and said, okay, what kind of clubs and organizations would you like to see at our school. And based on that, they've 
created some pretty innovative ones that we've never had before, and they're giving them a shot. This is at the intermediate level, but I think it's true to form that, okay, what students, what do you want to do? What are, what are you saying you want to see more of, different of, and, and how can we help support you? Because like the board is saying, through the culture and climate comes also the relationship with the student that's positive and productive, which takes you miles down the road in terms of their academic progress. With that strong foundation of a strong relationship that's positive, we go much, much further in academics at the same time. I move approval of the 2021-2022 board goals as presented. Second. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I have a motion by Ms. Duane and a second by Dr. Harland. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We worked hard on those. <laughs> okay, and next up is our annual training oh, report. Um, <coughs> so, Yay. should have been an email. Um, since 1986, the State Board of Education rule has required that a public announcement be made each year of the names of the board members who have completed the required continuing education hours and who are deficient. The annual required continuing education is a basic obligation and expectation of any sitting board member under state board of education rule. The president shall uh, cause the minutes of the local board to reflect this information. Senate Bill 1566 passed in the 85th legislative session amended the TEC section 11.159 section B changed the reporting board training hours from the last regular meeting of the calendar year to the last meeting held before an election of trustees. The minutes must now reflect whether each trustee has met or is deficient in meeting the required training required for the trustees as of the first anniversary of the date of the trustees election or appointment. Uh, board member President Martin Call at large place seven exceeded Vice President Dr. Julie Harland, single member district place two, exceeded. Secretary Felicia Benford, single member district place one, exceeded. Trustee Ruthie Waller, single member district place four, exceeded. Trustee Fran Duane, single member district place three, exceeded. Trustee Dr. Deidre Davis, at large place six, exceeded. And Trustee David Stasny, single member district place five, exceeded. All seven of the Bryan ISD trustees have met or exceeded the required hours of continuing education as of the first anniversary of the date of each board member's election or appointment to the Bryan ISD Board of Trustees in the following areas. One, topic one, special required training, legislative and regulatory as uh, State Board of Education. Topic two, team building. And topic three, additional continuing education. So. Yay, we all exceeded. Um, and not only that, but I will add that it was uh, very pleasant that a lot of us attended the same trainings throughout the year, and we were all there present as a board. So. I move approve the year-end report of the Board of Trustees continuing education requirements as presented. Second. Okay. Um, I have a motion by Dr. Harland and a second by Dr. Davis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And at this time, the board will convene in closed session. I love our new pictures, our new updated pictures. Matthew did that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Matthew. Mr. Jesus. LeBlanc just updated These are like pictures. as of a few days ago, some of these pictures. Yeah. Uh, great Good. job. Okay, the board will now convene in closed session to discuss the following items as allowed by Texas Government Code Chapter 551, um, 551.072, deliberations about real property, and 551.074, personnel matters. Um, no voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussion in closed session will take place after the board reconvenes in the open meeting. It is now 7.25.
the board reconvened in open session at 741. No action was taken in closed session. And if there's no additional comments or no action items, we are adjourned. All right.